Good evening. The charrette will start shortly. We are waiting for people to trickle in. We will start shortly. We're just waiting for more attendees to log in. The charrette will start shortly. We're just waiting for more uh, attendees to log in. Good evening, my name is Maria Teresita Velsheslanda. I am the project manager for the strategic Miami area rapid transit, a smart plan, east-west corridor, land use visioning and accessibility effort. On behalf of the Miami-Dade Transportation Planning Organization, we welcome you this evening to the second series of Charette for the east-west corridor. We're looking forward to your input tonight. So we request that all participants follow a very few simple guidelines. This meeting is being recorded. Panelists are encouraged to enable their web cameras when speaking. Participants will remain muted throughout the meeting. There will be interactive polling throughout the presentation. If you have a question, please submit it through the Q&A button and we will attend to address during the presentation. To provide input during the brainstorming session, please submit your comments and idea through the chat button. Tonight, we have several panelists that will walk you through the land use visioning and accessibility process. They include Wyatt Bowers from Atkins and Maria Benfeld from Plusorvius Design. Additional members of the project team with us this evening include Janine Gaslon from Miami-Dade TPO, Rosa Davis and Manny Armada, Miami-Dade Regulatory and Economic Resources, Tara Blakey and Francisco Arbelais, Miami-Dade Department of Transportation and Public Works, Jack Snesler, Atkins, and Juan Molarat and Cristina, Cristina Parrilla, Plusorbia Design. As noted, we are including interactive polling as well as two interactive brainstorm sessions throughout the presentation. We want to take this time to thank you for being here this evening with us. And before we start, we want to offer any elected official and or their staff that are here with us tonight an opportunity to address the attendees at this time. If you would like to speak, please click on the raise button so we can unmute you.
at this time, we don't see any hands raised up. So thank you. Now I would like to introduce you to Wyatt Bowers to get us started. Great, thank you. Good evening, everyone. Uh, so up on the slides right now, um, we have the presentation agenda. Uh, you can see we've just done some introductions and we're gonna move into the East-West Corridor, give you some background on the project first um, and the efforts that are going on on the corridor. Then we're gonna dive into the land use project description and have some public input. Like I said, uh, Mary Terry mentioned the brainstorming sessions um, as well as the live polling we're gonna do throughout. And then also we're gonna cover some station area accessibility. How do you get to and from the stations on the corridor uh, to areas surrounding and also get your input on that. So let's just dive right into a little bit of the project background and the SMART plan overall. Uh, the overview on the SMART plan, the overall plan was approved in 2016 by the TPO governing board. It is focused on six rapid transit corridors, which emanated originally in the People's Transportation Plan, as well as eight additional bus express rapid transit routes. There are multiple efforts being conducted as part of the SMART plan. Uh, led by the TPO are the land use scenario envisioning and economic mobility and accessibility efforts, which is what we're gonna talk about this evening. And then there are also rapid transit corridor or pd &E environmental and engineering efforts that are being conducted by FDOT and or DTPW, the Department of Transportation and Public Works. In the case of this East-West Corridor, it is led by DTPW. So talking a little bit about the land use envisioning overview, uh, the TPO is documenting the direct relationship between transit and land use for all of the smart plan rapid transit corridors. This is really key information and data that gets incorporated into the federal grant applications to um, assist and make the case for federal funding stronger. And in addition, we're looking to promote transit use and increase the mobility choices for people along the corridor who would be using the transit system. The East-West Corridor locally preferred alternative. This is a federal um, terminology in through the federal transit approval process. The selection of an LPA or locally preferred alternative represents a critical milestone in that federal block process. Um, and in October of 2020, the TPO adopted bus rapid transit as the locally preferred alternative for the East-West Corridor. Uh, this provides a technical basis for development of transit supportive land uses, which is what we will be discussing this evening. Now, taking a look real quick at the corridor, uh, what you see here is an overall corridor map from starting at the Miami Intermodal Center on the east or the right hand side, uh, going out to the Tamiami Terminal on the west or the left hand side of the map. Um, as noted, the locally preferred alternative BRT um, includes a couple of routes that would go along 836 with one extending to downtown and then a third route which would um, be implemented in a second phase, which provides service along 7th Street and through Blue Lagoon. Um, what you see in, in this map is shows again the same routes, but also delineates the stations from the Miami Intermodal Center, Lejeune Road, several stations in Blue Lagoon, um, several stations along 7th Street, extending to Mall of the Americas, and then back up onto 836 to the 87th, 97th, and 107th Avenues, um, and out to the Dolphin Terminal, which recently opened, and eventually out to the Tamiami Terminal, which is under construction. They will be dedicated bus on shoulder on the 836 extension, uh, but on 836 itself, uh, there will be center stations at the 107th, 97th, and 87th Avenue locations. I will show you a rendering in just a second of that as well as a rendering showing dedicated transit lanes on Northwest 7th um, from Mall of the Americas through to Blue Lagoon. So here is a vision from uh, DTPW of the 87th Avenue station. You can see here the, uh, again, the station in the median. Um, it would be accessed from below uh, for pedestrians and, and such walking up and then taking an elevator or escalator or stairs up to the center of platforms. Uh, the buses would be able to use the median space as well as you can see there um, the left hand shoulder which today exists with uh, painted red um, so allowing for bus on shoulder. Now 
when we're at grade, for example, on 7th Street at ground level, the you can see this vision, um, which includes dedicated lanes on 7th so that uh, existing uh, vehicular traffic is not impeded. Um, but you can see this is a station near Milam Dairy um, and adjacent to the Miami Airport Convention Center. So now that we've gotten a quick overview of the corridor and the locally preferred alternative, we want to start in with some of our voting this evening. Um, and we're going to start real quick um, with just some easy questions to get familiar with the process. There will be a pop-up screen that will come up um, on this first question. We're asking, how did you hear about the meeting today? Um, did you see the flyer or maybe there was a newspaper ad or email, um, internet or social media, and of course, word of mouth. Give you a few more seconds to respond. Okay, let's go ahead and uh, close the poll. So uh, most of you uh, got an email. That's great. We sent a few emails, including I think a reminder even today, which is terrific. And some of you saw it on social media or heard about it from others. Thank you. All right, next question. Um, hold on one second here. There we go. Were you familiar with the SMART plan before this meeting? Um, yes, no, or somewhat. All right, we'll close the poll in just a few seconds. Oh, there you go, perfect. Um, so almost everyone has heard of it. Um, hopefully, um, the one person who voted no will learn a lot about the SMART plan this evening. Okay, let's um, go to the next question. How do you use the East-West cor Corridor currently today? Do you live on or near the corridor? Do you work or attend school on or near the corridor? Do you live and work um, on or near the corridor? And if neither, do you travel the corridor regularly, maybe every day as a commuter, or maybe it's occasionally just to go to the airport or the shopping malls or something? Okay, give it a few more seconds here. All right, we'll go ahead and close that. Okay, great. So um, predominant number is travel occasionally, also with some who live and work on or near the corridor. That's terrific. All right, I believe we have a couple more questions here in this first set. How do you think rapid transit service on the east-west corridor would affect traffic? Um, does it lead to traffic increasing, decreasing, or do you think there would be no impact? A few more seconds. All right, we'll go ahead and close this one. <clears throat> Okay, good. Uh, most people feel that it will decrease traffic also um, with several thinking no impact and a few believing that traffic would be increased. Now a similar question, how do you think rapid transit service along the east-west corridor affects housing costs? Do you think costs would increase, possibly decrease, or no effect? Just a few more seconds. All right, let's go ahead and close this one. Okay, so this is interesting. We basically have um, a split decision, I think. Um, almost even to cost will increase versus uh, no effect um, with only one person thinking the costs will go down. Okay, so again, that was just kind of a warm up on the polling. Now we're gonna jump into um, a land use project description um, and again, we're going to continue to get some input throughout this part, as well as the brainstorming that will happen at the end of this section. So let's talk about land use and transportation and how they go together and integrate. Um, all of the things that you see revolving around the circle um, are directly related to that land use transportation integration. How we do housing, um, how we protect our natural systems, 
um, energy and climate, economic development and in industry, um, as well as arts and culture and education. Now, the scenario planning process that we have been conducting as part of this effort uh, started out with getting information on population and employment uh, for 2010 and 2040. Um, also looking at the Federal Transit Administration's guidelines. Again, this is helpful for getting us into the federal grant process and hopefully getting federal funding um, to move these efforts uh, forward. We also have a series of charrettes, which this is the second series that we're doing this evening, um, and three scenarios of different land use options were developed. Then those were tested with ridership to see how that land use uh, scenario affects ridership. And now we're at the stage where we're refining that alternative and being consistent with the LPA that I mentioned earlier and looking at what land use policy changes might be needed to bring this to reality. So um, I showed you a map earlier of the corridor. This one is a similar map, but the difference is that we're showing our, what we're calling our buffer or our project area, which extends a half mile in all directions around the corridor. This is the area that we are looking at for potential growth, mainly that would be focused near proposed stations. It is important to note that some areas are, for example, on the western end outside of the urban development boundary or even near the airport on the runways, those are not suitable or permissible for development. So we are not suggesting that development would happen in everywhere in this pink shaded buffer, but this is the area that we are evaluating. So I mentioned that we are in our second series of charrettes tonight. Um, we had a first series about three years ago where we brought the public together to talk about different ideas and do some brainstorming um, exercises. You can see here a quote from an FIU student, which was terrific um, in their, you know, their desire to increase their attachment to the city um, and hoping that transportation can help in, in bringing that to fruition. Um, some of the findings that we had in the charrette, again, there were some polling questions that we asked similar to those that we're asking tonight. We also did um, a brainstorming exercise where we looked at challenges. You can see, for example, the 836 barrier, the airport. Sometimes some of these challenges are also assets or opportunities, which you'll see in a second. Um, for example, opportunities, the fact that we have uh, the Ludlam Trail, the CSX rail line, um, land availability, the, the, the 836 right of way is also very large, um, which is a great opportunity. In terms of liabilities, there was concern about height restrictions. For example, because we're near the airport, um, we can't build 25 and 30 story buildings along this district, uh, this corridor, especially within the runway paths. Um, costs for setup and operations of transit, as well as you know what kind of feeder routes there might be. And then thinking lastly about the assets, there are a lot of great um, anchors on this corridor from the airport with, you know, pre-pandemic nearly 50 million uh, passengers a year uh, to FIU with over 50,000 students um, attending FIU, the various malls along the corridor, the fact that we have a diverse population. Again, you see the Ludlam Trail um, and, and mentioning the 836 right of way which as I mentioned, can be an opportunity and an asset while also being a challenge. And you'll see that this evening in how we try to tie everything together and provide access to these stations. So let's dive a little bit into the land use scenario development just to give you a little background on, on the process. Um, so we start with a 2040 population projection that is based on natural growth. Keep in mind that you know Miami and South Florida and Florida as a whole continues to grow um, and will continue to grow with or without these transportation investments. Um, in the case of our corridor, we're expected growth to go up about 20% to 93,000 people and employment to grow by 40% up to about 96,000 jobs within that corridor buffer that I showed earlier. Now, the land use scenarios that we developed were to support different alternatives that were evaluated during the rapid transit corridor study. And again, this evening, we now have a new scenario that's been developed in support of the LPA for bus rapid transit that we're gonna ask for your input on. But I wanna take a second before we get into that and just step back and talk about transit-oriented communities and what they look like. 
Um, so what we're talking about is generally higher densities, moderate to high density areas that are near transit stations. You can see on the map of the graphic, I guess on the right, um, a transit core that extends about a quarter mile out. That's about a five minute walk um, for most people with a transit neighborhood extending about a half mile or 10 minutes out. And then further out is a transit supportive area. Again, that would be expected that it's probably more than your average person would walk, but that's where the first mile, last mile ideas come in, where we're looking at transit circulators or car share, um, scooters, things like that, that can help bring people to their final destinations. Um, it is worth noting, and I'm gonna show you this in just a second, that not all of these many, in fact, um, of the transit station areas that have developed over time are not perfect concentric circles, of course. In some cases, they in fact um, lean to one side or the other of the station. But we do have a really perfect, we, we call it kind of a poster child example of a transit oriented corridor. This is in the DC, Washington DC uh, metropolitan region. And you can see this is along a transit corridor um, and you can clearly see from the development and the building heights where the stations are. And there are five stations along the route um, in, this, in this vicinity. But as soon as you get outside of about a quarter mile or a third of a mile from there, we go back to low density, single family residential. The neighborhoods are the same that they have been for 50 or 60 years um, with very little change. So let's think about our corridor for just a second. Um, we have some existing activity centers already along the corridor. As we talked about the assets earlier, we have the airport and, and the airport uh, intermodal center area, the Blue Lagoon office district, as well as the corporate center uh, drive west of the airport, um, Mall of the Americas, and then moving out with Northwest 87th leading into uh, to downtown Doral and the International and Dolphin Malls. And then there are some things that are just off corridor, but within you know a mile or two, like FIU, uh, downtown Doral that I just mentioned, downtown Coral Gables, these things that, again, we want to look to how we can bring uh, folks to and from those areas and, and the 836 transit corridor. So as we start to think about what our station areas on this corridor could look like, it's important to have a kind of a grounding on scale and density. Um, so this is a, an interesting graphic. This is the Dolphin Mall on the left. Um, it's about a half mile from the ring road on either end. It includes the mall and the parking lots. If you took that same you know, shape and superimposed it on the right-hand side, that covers just about all of downtown Coral Gables. So keep in mind, think about the amount of development um, and people and jobs and, and shopping and everything else that you see in Coral Gables and imagine that that could all fit on the Dolphin Mall site. Now, density. Um, for a lot of people, there's a feeling that density means big, tall buildings. And sometimes it does, uh, but it doesn't have to. So this image on the left, for example, maybe those uh, condominium units are 2,500 to 3,000 square feet on average uh, or something, while the image on the right would be more like uh, small micro apartments where there may be 250 to 300 square feet each. But the density, 125 units per acre, is the same in both examples. So keeping that in mind, um, the density can have a different shape and a different look as we move forward in this discussion. So thinking about <clears throat> some transit-oriented communities in Miami, and note that I mentioned earlier, again, that in some cases, they're, they're not very concentric circles around stations. A perfect example is downtown Dadeland, where you can see there all of the development is north, in essence, of the Dadeland South Metro Rail station. Similarly, um, the shops at Merrick Park area, the Douglas Road Metro Rail um, at the southern end of Coral Gables, at the top of the image, you can see downtown Coral Gables. So it's an interesting comparison between the sizes. Um, and as I just mentioned, that comparison on scale. And one final example in the Miami-Dade area, the Brownsville Transit Village. So we're not necessarily always talking about something that has to be a, a, a very large mix of lots of different buildings. It could be a, a simple project um, that is on, you know, maybe a former park and ride um, that is redeveloped into, you know, housing with maybe some retail opportunities. Um, and this is a great example of that. 
Now, another example, and we're going to move into some more polling here. These next few images are of different rapid transit corridors on the East Coast, all related to either the rapid transit is on or near an expressway. So it's very similar to the situation that we have on 836. We're asking you to rank these images on a scale of one to five from low to high. Um, and we'll go ahead and bring up the poll for the first image here. And I will note that what's shaded in kind of a goldish circle is the actual station location. So again, please rank this um, on a score from one to five. You may need to slide your um, polling you know, pop-up screen off to the side of the, the uh, image so that you can see it. And, and I'll tell you as we're doing this one, uh, this is an example where the development that you see close into the transit station that is in fact on a former park and ride uh, facility of the transit station. But we'll give you just a few more seconds to hopefully get a few more people voting on this one. All right, let's go ahead and close the poll. So it looks like this is kind of a middle of the road, um, you know, answer. That's that's kind of what I might have expected on this one. Um, and I'll tell you uh, that this is in the Baltimore area. Um, as I move to the second image, we're going to start this again. Same question, rank it low to high. Um, what you can see here is the, and we'll bring the polling up but you can see the transit station um, to the right-hand side of the image there. Um, also, most of the development that's occurring, you can see some under construction, is moderate, uh, mid-rise, you know, four to six stories. Uh, but you can also see some single-family homes um, to the edge as well as some natural areas. So again, it's focused um, fairly close to the station area. There is a decent amount of surface parking. This is a growing um, transit-oriented area. Give you about 10 more seconds on this one. All right, we'll go ahead and close this poll. Okay, so maybe doing a little bit better here. We're, we're going into the maybe a 3.5 average or something. Um, I will tell you that this one is in the Washington DC area, just north of DC in Maryland. All right, option number three. Um, Again, rank from one to five. Um, I would note here as the poll comes up that the transit station in this case is off to the left. Again, noting that it, it seems like the development around it is, is geared to one side. Um, again, similar to the previous example, more mid-rise um, in the four to you know maybe seven, eight stories with the exception of right there at the station where we have a probably a 10 to 12 story uh, office building. And you can see some uh, some townhomes as well as some apartments, um, as well as, you know, some even probably big box retail. And we'll give you just a few, maybe another 10 seconds on this one. All right, let's go ahead and close this. Okay, so back to the middle of the road on this one. Um, but, but a few people giving it a four and five, so that's nice to see. Um, I, uh, this is in the Atlanta area, by the way. Um, okay, we got two more to go. Uh, so this one, as we bring up our fourth example, again, the transit station is on the left-hand side. Um, you can see there the expressway near the bottom, um, very large expressway. This is an area that honestly um, has developed over time pre prior, pre uh, bringing transit into it. But um, heavy, you know, rapid transit has entered the area over the last uh, few years and development has uh, grown. Um, you could definitely see uh, more density than the previous examples with higher buildings, uh, but still not, you know, su super tall might be a good way to summarize that. And we'll give you another 10 seconds on this one. Okay, let's go ahead and close this. Uh, this is, um, I guess, our typical bell, sh bell curve, maybe. So nobody really rated it super low, nor did anyone rate it super high. Um, and we're kind of in the middle on that. Um, this is interesting. So if anyone's familiar, this is the Tyson's Corner area uh, outside of Washington, DC. Okay, final example. 
as I bring this up. So as we go to bring this one, I will tell you that the transit station you can see on the right hand side at the bottom of the graphic, there is an expressway. Um, and you can see actually it goes underneath some of the buildings there. Um, we definitely have more high rise in this instance, but you also have, as you can see there, probably right in the middle of the picture, a large shopping mall. Maybe this is similar to what could happen uh, around the Dolphin and in international malls, for example. I will give this another 10 seconds. Okay, let's go ahead and close this one out. Okay, so interesting. So it's um, probably maybe rates higher than the others, um, but definitely still some people who, you know, ranked it in the lower to middle. Um, and for anyone who's familiar, this is the uh, Buckhead area in Atlanta and the Lenox Square Mall and the Lenox Marta Station. All right, so now I'm gonna close our polls and we're gonna move back to our corridor. And start to take a look at our corridor as it as it comes up here on a little video you'll see the line uh, extending from the Miami Intermodal Center all the way out to the Tamiami Terminal again with stations at Lejeune um, several in the Blue Lagoon area dipping down along 7th out to Mall of the Americas and then back up on 836 at 87th 97th 107th and again the Dolphin Terminal so now let's talk for just a few minutes about the scenario that we developed for um, our, our transit supportive scenario consistent with the LPA. Um, what we've expecting uh, in, our, in our estimate here is a 2040 stationary population target of 113,000. Now keep in mind, I mentioned earlier that we were already gonna have about 93,000 in this corridor with without the transit investment, for example. So we're expecting that this would be an increase of 20,000 over that natural growth. Most of which we are projecting that station growth would be focused at the stations that are shown uh, highlighted in circles on your map there, at the Dolphin Terminal 107th and 97th and at the MIC in the first phase. And as the second phase of the BRT uh, is implemented, then we would also um, look to see growth happening along the 7th Street corridor. So keeping that in mind, again, 113,000, which is an increase of 20,000 focused at these station areas. And now I want to ask you, how do you feel about that? Um, are the population targets too high for this corridor, too low, or hopefully did we get it about right? I'll give you a couple more seconds here. All right, let's go ahead and close this one. So interesting. Um, we have a few people who believe too high, also some who think it's too low. And um, maybe in the Goldilocks world, we, we got it about right. Um, but that's, you know, we'll have some opportunities to comment about that as we get into the brainstorming in just a few minutes and help us to think about, you know, if it's too high or too low, or maybe we got the stations wrong and you'd like to see the growth in a different area. So we'll take into that as we get into the brainstorming. But next I wanna ask you about employment. It's kind of a similar question. Um, again, we mentioned that uh, we were expecting about 96,000 employees uh, by 2040 in the corridor with natural growth. So in this case, with the investment of bus rapid transit, we could expect perhaps another 23,000 above that. Um, again, the phase one growth at the same stations that mentioned earlier along Dolphin Terminal 107th, 97th and the MIC. And again, with the investment of the second phase um, growth that could happen along the 7th Street corridor. So similar question. How do you feel about the employment targets that we've developed? Are they too high, too low or maybe about right? A 
few more seconds on this one. All right, let's go ahead and uh, close it. Okay, so in this case, it seems like we might have gotten it about right. Um, the predominant answer seems to think we were in the right range. That's great. Um, again, we'll be able to take comments as we get into the brainstorming and think about that. Um, but now I want to just kind of step back into the types of stations. Um, and I showed you some images before, but not every station is the same. Not every station area is the same. Uh, so in Miami-Dade County, we've developed um, generalized station typologies. And you see, for example, a regional, like in downtown, uh, the government center in Miami Central Station. Um, metropolitan, which might be more like what you would see uh, at Dade Land South, um, or even a community station where densities would be a little lower. Um, and I know the image there is taller buildings, keeping in mind that on this corridor, because of the airport, some of our densities and heights would not be uh, as, as shown on this graphic. So when we think about our corridor and we think about regional station areas, the only one on our corridor that we think is a regional station is the Miami Intermodal Center. Um, and maybe in a density example would be similar to downtown Coral Gables. Um, with residential focused on higher density and multifamily uses, um, with non-residential focused again on high-rise buildings, um, and keeping in mind that at the MIC we might be more like mid-rise buildings because of the airport. But the key is that we have minimal surface parking, that most parking is in structure or below grade even. As we think about metropolitan station areas on our corridor, we, we think there's about five of them maybe. Um, and an example might be the kind of development um, intensity and density that you see in South Beach. Um, residential focused on mid-rise, again, multifamily predominantly, um, with non-residential focused, again, at mid-rise buildings um, with hopefully minimal surface parking and um, aiming for on-street as well as structured parking. And then finally, at the community scale stations, where, where we have the most on this corridor, um, we have seven of them. This is where the residential is focused on low rise multifamily, but also where some single family residential could be introduced. Um, and again, the non residential is focused on low rise buildings. There would be surface parking, but ideally it's behind the buildings, as you can see in the example image from Miami Lakes. So these are just some thoughts of, of how we are scaling up the various stations. And now we're going to move into our interactive brainstorming session. I'm going to stop sharing my screen in just a second so that uh, Maria can bring up hers. But what we're asking you to do is put any ideas that you have in the chat. Um, and we're going to be able to put those up on screen. But also, if there's any questions that people have asked, go ahead and put those in the Q&A. And we'll try to address those at the same time. And I'm going to stop sharing now. Okay, so Maria's brought up um, our, our little interactive brainstorming. And what's really nice as she zooms in is that we've been able to bring uh, the poll results into the graphic um, so that it helps as we're trying to frame some of our thoughts this evening. Um, and I would note that we're gonna do this hopefully twice. Um, so what we're asking you to do in this session is kind of focus on our stations, um, our station areas, the land use, um, what land uses are needed? Um, did we, are we off, you know, some of you felt that our population was too high, for example. Um, but, you know, and I'm just trying to prime the, the questions, but you know, thinking about um, out at Northwest 107th, for example, um, a lot of the development that's north of the expressway is commercial and office, and the residential is all south of the expressway. Um, would it be helpful to have that mixed? Maybe some more residential on the north, hand, north side um, or more you know, employment on the south side. Um, just some thoughts that, again, if you'll go ahead and put us any ideas that you have into the chat. And you know, again, if you have some questions, we can take those as well. Okay, so we have a question about uh, the corridor incentivizing the incur incentivizing or encouraging the use of electric vehicle infrastructure and solar power. That's a great idea. And, and how would we integrate and consider uh, green space and parks in the station locations uh, to help with shade? 
as well as just opportunities for recreation, um, both passive and active. Uh, and by the way, we had a we had this charrette last evening and also had a few people that uh, remarked the same. So that's great. Um, note that suspect few people want to live at the MIC, which is a transit hub, but not a place to live. Um, I think that's an interesting point. Uh, there's no question that the area around the intermodal center today is not very residential. Um, and you would need to do um, some uh, sound buffering um, with the buildings in order to, to make that happen, uh, to get residential in the area so close to the runways. Uh, but I, I can tell you that there are obviously lots of hotels in the area. In fact, I quite often stay there um, when I'm in town um, in that area. So there, there might be some opportunities, but it's, it's a definitely a point. Um, there was a um, effort done by the, uh, by the county several years ago and called the Palmer Lake Area Plan, which is, is that area east of the MIC. Um, next comment that came in, I feel that to better enjoy the benefits of additional density around the station, what types of neighborhood development should seek to minimize surface parking, uh, something like Coral Gables, less like Miami Lakes. Good, quite a good point. Um, yeah, and I, I see we put it up on the on the board already. There was a question about how students uh, reach FIU from this line. Um, let me ask you this, and and you know we can come back to it. We can do it right now. But you know we might have a few feeder routes that would extend from the 107 station, or maybe the Dolphin station, or both. Um, but do you have a, you know, I'd be curious if there's a preference. Do we think that um, it would be easier or more desirable along 107th? Or is it, you know, maybe quicker from the Dolphin Terminal, which will have a decent amount of parking facility, whereas the 107th site um, would probably have less parking? Okay, you can see we're drawing these in as we go. Um, so what do you think about, let me prime a couple more questions. Um, the, the, where you see Mall of the America Station and the wedge that's near uh, 836 and 826, uh, the wedge is a, a site that um, is off 7th and that area, 7th Street is under construction underneath 826 right now. Um, you know, as that, you know, that area is very industrial right now um, between 826 and Milam Dairy. But, you know, it's imagining that this could change dramatically um, with the connection underneath um, the Palmetto as well as this transit option. Um, you know, are we right there? Um, is there a desire to live, for example, near the Ludlam Trail um, with, you know, which would be at the 7th and Milam Dairy stations? Um, there is some residential that's just been introduced right in that vicinity, um, kind of where those, those lakes are. Um, but that's the first residential that's in the Blue Lagoon area. Maybe there's a desire for some additional residential in Blue Lagoon um, so that people are traveling less distance to get to work. Ah, and then in the, quest, in the questions and answers, a good one. Uh, is potential growth driving the plan versus serving existing activity um, and that's an interesting question. Um, I think we're probably looking to try and do both. I think it obviously uh, for a transit, you know, service to, to be successful, it needs to serve the folks that are there today. Um, you know, many of the images that I showed of um, development around transit stations elsewhere, and even with Miami-Dade, uh, for example, downtown Dadeland, most of that didn't happen over, it happened over the last 20 years. Um, even though the system has been in place for probably about 45 years now, I guess. Um, so it's, it's an interesting question. Uh, a comment in the chat noticing, oh wait, let me scroll up, sorry. And I realize you guys are faster than I am. If you have level boarding, you can expand the transit radius by using bikes. You will need an open area in the front of the bus as well for bikes, wheelchairs, motor, mobility, scooters, et cetera. Great point. Um, so uh, the ability for the buses to be able to handle bikes. Um, 
and I do think in the in the graphics we were showing, um, but uh, Tara or uh, if, if you can comment on this, I, I, I believe the plan right now, at least on the 836 part of the corridor, is to have level boarding. Um, uh, correct, Wyatt. Um, oh, Francisco, thank you. Yeah, uh, how are you doing, Francisco Abelais, DTPW. Um, the idea is that we follow the same example that the South Corridor has, um, has followed, and that includes level boarding. Okay, great, thank you. So um, we would, you know, just just to uh, you know, that's the idea that we're going to follow. That's yeah. not to say that it's are we know we know it's going in in which right. location. That's that's the goal for now. Okay, good. Um, notice uh, in the chat here, and notice from the visualization of the bus stops on eight thirty six, there don't appear to be bike lanes connected to the stations. These are huge for priming the area for more transit use. Um, great point. Um, and we actually discussed this a little bit last evening. Uh, thinking about the stations along 87th um, and 97th, 107th, for example, um, you know, are bike lanes on road bike lanes the better answer, or do we want to maybe consider, um, you know, very wide sidewalks where it's kind of like a shared use path, um, or or maybe it's both. Um, so we'll put that question up on the board. We also have a comment about Miami weather. Oh, definitely a point. How do you protect commuters from weather? Um, i.e. rain or heat. So do we have climate control at the stations? Um, I know that's something that was considered, uh, being considered for the South Corridor. Um, but how do we, especially if you're walking to the station in the center of the expressway, for example, on 97th, you have a very long bridge. Um, how do we make sure that there's a shade as well as good lighting, for example, for evening? Um, you know, uh, maybe in the in the Jetsons world, we're thinking about moving sidewalks that are climate controlled. Um, uh, th that might not be super feasible, but it, it's an interesting question that definitely needs to be thought about. Uh, comment back, a shared use path can be used by cyclists that are not comfortable riding on an unprotected bike lane. So that's a, a good point for maybe having both, both types of facilities. And, and I would note that, you know, the Ludlam Trail has been drawn in, but keep in mind, there's also a trail along 836 on the western part of 836 on the north side uh, near the CSX rail line. Um, and so that could be a great east-west opportunity and how we connect that in uh, with the transit. Um, and then a comment that's coming in, which is getting us right into where we're going to go next, um, thinking about art and gardens and green common areas. So we're going to talk about, and we've been doing a lot of this already, talking about accessibility, which we'll get into in just a minute. But I want to give um, a couple more seconds or minutes for people's thoughts. Uh, there's a question about, are there preparations for future circulation drop off of autonomous cars and buses as a reason to not need as much surface parking. Um, good, good point. Um, and then noted, yes, the Kitty Rydell Trail is from 87th to 107th. That's the one I was referring to, and we've drawn that in. So it seems like a lot of people are um, bringing up questions about what I mentioned earlier, this first mile, last mile. How do we get people? Again, Nobody lives or works directly on 836. Now on 7th, maybe so, but not on 836 directly. So getting people to and from those stations uh, to their, their origin or their final destination is gonna be really important. So um, Maria, if we can take, you know, just a few more seconds to draw some things in there. Um, and then if you'll stop sharing, then I can go back and bring up the PowerPoint and we can move us into that second part. All right, great, thank you. Okay, let's try and share screen again. Um, this one, I believe. Okay, so as I mentioned, now we're gonna kind of jump into station area accessibility and get your input on this as well. Um, as I mentioned, the first mile, last mile, 
you know, what kind of strategies do we want to look for? You see folks, uh, you know, in this before image, they're, they're on 836, for example, and just uh, they're late to work because it's always congested. But, you know, what if they could just um, get themselves to the bus and then hop on the bus and uh, turn their Wi-Fi on and, you know, listen to a, a podcast, for example, or something like that. Um, and with um, uh, relative consistency on time performance, then they're at work or at their appointment on time. Um, but at the end of the day, first and last mile is about complementing and uh, augmenting the existing services and facilities, but really about broadening the reach of transit and expanding it. So again, when we have this spine on 836, how do we get that reach expanded more than the half mile out to a mile or even two miles out? Um, and then we leverage those smart plan investments more, which really brings in more ridership and more um, hopeful tax base. So when we think about the East-West corridor, this is the image from earlier that shows the line and the stations, but you can also see now flashing uh, extensions out to, as we mentioned, FIU, um, maybe the Nicholas Children's Hospital, maybe downtown Doral and City Place, uh, down to downtown Coral Gables. If you think about it, uh, downtown Coral Gables is only about two miles um, from the Lejeune station. So it's within that range of, even though it, it says first mile, last mile, but we're really talking about things that are within a couple of miles. Uh, maybe it's serving the Miami Springs area. Um, so these are some of the things that we want to think about. Um, what are some of the destinations you might want to get to and how do we best um, accommodate that? When we're thinking about pedestrian strategies, um, you know, safe crossings, wider sidewalks, um, you know, shade, as we mentioned, um, pedestrian amenities, uh, universal design so that it's uh, available for people of all abilities. Um, and then, you know, do we have a mix of uses and a vibrant ground, you know, pedestrian atmosphere, which is being shown that people are willing to walk uh, longer distances with their vibrancy uh, to look at. In terms of bicycle access strategies, are we thinking about, um, again, shared use paths, um, separated bike lanes, uh, secure cycle facilities, lockers um, at the stations. Do we have bike share and, and maybe scooter share and those kinds of things available? Um, do we have bicycle repair stations and other facilities and connections that help uh, ride people to the stations? In terms of transit, again, uh, some people are going to arrive at this spine transit taking a bus, a feeder bus, or maybe a circulator shuttle. Um, and how do we integrate those services so that you know, there's minimal transfer waiting time. And then when you're at a waiting area, is it safe and comfortable, which gets at the questions that were mentioned earlier about climate, for example. But also keeping in mind that you know, this, this corridor and, and the several stations on this corridor are going to be somewhat geared maybe to the automobile. Um, so do we have parking? Um, and how much parking should we have? You know, how much do you accommodate for uh, pickup, drop off and, and things like Uber and Lyft and taxis? Um, and then if you have the, the auto um, component, how do you ensure that we are calming that traffic so that it's still creating um, a somewhat comfortable pedestrian environment? When we're talking about when you're like right at the station, the wayfinding, a pedestrian scale. How? Where is the elevator? If if I can't go up the stairs, how do I how do I find that? Where's the best um, entry point for me that minimizes my walk distance? At the same time, for parking, um, what's the best entrance for pick up a drop off versus maybe long term parking? Uh, those are important signage things to keep in to keep in consideration. Um, safety and security. We've talked about it. Do you know if we're talking about Comfortability, we want shade and landscape, um, but we also want lighting. It's gonna be really important, especially in the evenings um, and keeping eyes on the street, which is a key feature, especially on the 7th Street corridor where we do have some uses, um, but there are gonna be some potentially decent distances people will need to walk um, on the 836 line and making sure that they feel safe and secure in that walk. And then at the station itself, you know, there's, maybe some amenities. Do you have newsstands or kiosks to pick up a, a donut or you know a cup of coffee on the way to work? Um, do you have an open space or plazas? Do you have public art and other visual enhancements to keep people um, uh, 
entertained for the lack of a better term while they're waiting um, for the transit. All right, so now we are back to polling for just a few questions about um, what we just talked about in terms of access. And I wanna start this with which east-west corridor station are you likely to use most often? Now I will note there are more than 10 stations on the corridor, but we are limited to only 10 options. So you can see there that the 7th Street West stations have been uh, combined together as have the 7th Street East stations and the two Blue Lagoon stations, um, which has enabled us to get to 10 options. So if you'll take a few seconds to think about this, which one station you might use more often than others. All right, give you just a couple more seconds here. Let's see if we get a few more answers in. All right, we'll go ahead and close the poll. So it looks like um, kind of a mix, but um, the Miami Intermodal Center um, and is seems to be the most popular, um, followed by Blue Lagoon and then several spacing out um, throughout different answers uh, all the way out to the Tamiami Terminal on the west hand side. Okay, so next question. Thinking about, now this might be for all of the stations, how would you plan to access those stations? Would you primarily walk um, or bike? Do you think you would drive and then park your car or park and ride? Or do you think maybe you'd have you know someone drive and drop you off or you'd take a taxi or Uber? Um, perhaps you'd take the bus or a trolley um, or is there some other way? Um, maybe it's a hovercraft um, or a, um, a drone would fly you to the station. Or, or it could be skateboard, for example. Um, and, and I would submit that like a scooter might fit under bike, but you could also put that under other. So we'll give you about 10 more seconds on this one. All right, we'll go ahead and close this poll. Okay, so good mix, but um, predominant for drive, which, uh, which is interesting. Because um, I guess, you know, yes, you can park at the, at the Miami Intermodal Center, um, but, you know, the Dolphin Terminal has a lot of parking today. Um, and that was not a highly ranked station, I believe, um, on our previous question. But it's, it's an interesting balance that we're going to have to think about as we go through. Okay, what is the generally most important access strategy? Um, for us to consider on the corridor, pedestrian, bicyclist, transit, auto, or other. And, and while, we're, while we're filling this in, I noted in the, a comment in the chat, good point that we should have had Metro Rail as an option because if you were coming to the MIC, you could do that by Metro Rail. So when I said bus, trolley, it should have also had a, a Metro Rail as part of that. So thank you for that comment, it'll be noted. <laughs> Uh, give you a couple more seconds on this one, please. All right, and we'll go ahead and close this poll. Okay, so most important strategy, uh, pedestrian, but also transit. Um, and keeping that in mind, it's interesting. Again, that balance of how do we do this if a lot of people are going to drive to the stations, but yet our main access strategy should be geared um, to pedestrian or transit. Um, this is going to be a, an interesting uh, effort that we'll go through over the next few years. Okay, um, last question. What is the most important amenity needed at the stations? Um, is it parking for cars? Is it parking for bicycles? Uh, wayfinding signage. These are the things we just showed you. Shade, lighting, uh, plazas for gathering, uh, kiosks for food and convenience, public art. Um, if you had to pick one most important amenity, what would it be? Okay, give you just a few more seconds on this question. All right, we'll go ahead and close this poll. Okay, so we've got a, an interesting mix. Again, auto parking um, and shade as our top answers um, with lighting and a few others uh, dribbled in there. So keep in mind those questions and thoughts as we um, 
move back into our online engagement. And I will note that there were a few things that came in the chat. Um, it's a very another great point that your origin method of arrival at a station may not be the same as what you use at the end. So maybe you take um, the bus to the Dolphin Terminal, but your end, your end arrival station is government center. And from there, you walk to your office. Um, but I'm going to stop sharing and we're going to go back into the interactive brainstorming and we're going to put some more thoughts up on the on the Miro board and uh, again use the chat function or the Q&A. Hey Maria, we are ready for you. Okay, um, one thing that's come in uh, and obviously we have a couple of these comments that came in in the chat that I just read that we could add. Um, but a new one, if I could use a local bus line to get to Tamiami on time to connect to the east-west line, I would definitely not use a car. So that's a key point. Um, the Tamiami terminal is, you know, is under construction, as I understand it, and the idea being a good feeder in for people, especially uh, in the Kendall um, area, to maybe, you know, come up and get through. Um, so it's an important um, having reliable local bus service that brings you to that point. Okay, any other thoughts, um, again, about access? We, we talked a lot about um, bikes earlier, but, you know, we, we were just discussing parking. So, um, you know, what stations should have, for lack of a better term, a robust amount of parking? Um, you know, again, I mentioned Dolphin Terminal, for example, there's a lot of surface parking at that station today. Um, it could be that over time, and this was true with some of the examples I showed you earlier, um, they were on surface parking and then over time um, it went to structured parking, which allowed for also some development to happen near site. Um, but what are some stations that we should focus on for parking? Not seeing anything coming in on the chat um, regarding that, but you know, go ahead and think of some thoughts for us. Um, what about you know? How do we? What are some thoughts? How do we encourage pedestrian activity when you know that was a, a really important access strategy that you all mentioned? Um, but how do we do that uh, in the area where the the um, transit line is on the expressway? You know, how, how can what what are some things we can do? to make you know, the walk, for example, on 87th, 97th, and 107th more comfortable. And, and then I would, I would note that um, we, we got a comment in the chat about, I guess that was for parking at the Lejeune station. Um, and also um, a comment. Um, so there is, of course, a, a planned shuttle um, from FIU to the Dolphin Terminal. And then the, um, there is the current Doral trolleys which connect FIU into that area. So that's something to keep in mind. Um, and, and we asked that question earlier about which station might be best to get to FIU. Is it Dolphin or, or uh, 107th? Um, suggestion came in for parking garages that might have green roofs or solar on top. Great comment. Um, looking also to encourage pedestrian activity include exercise equipment benches and fountains features for children and pets great comment um, pedestrian uh, amenities would be great help uh, protection from the sun and rain uh, again so maybe these are covered sidewalks um, uh, you know maybe they're not climate controlled maybe there's just misters or something to help during the heat um, make the walk wide and shaded with trees again there's another way to to help street trees um, for more comfortable walk. Um, parking at the West Terminal. So I'm assuming that and bike provisions where destinations are too far to walk. So I guess parking at Dolphin, we have it. And uh, I guess the point would also be at the Tamiami Terminal. Um, bike parking must be covered, close, and convenient. So um, that's an So I guess we're talking about: um, does it need to be lockers, 
um, or are we just talking about a, a covered bike facility? You know, if, if you've ever been to uh, the Netherlands, for example, um, you know, it's a very bike friendly country. Um, they literally have uh, in Utrecht now a bicycle parking garage that holds about 20,000 bicycles. Um, and, and I took a tour of it a few years ago and it, you literally like you do in at an airport garage or something, you, you come in and it tells you where there are spaces on what level um, and you get your locker. Um, I don't know that we need something quite as robust, but uh, definitely maybe covered bike parking is key. Um, rain gardens, green infrastructure to help manage future heavy rainfall and support pollinators. That's a good green comment. Um, and then the, I guess related to the bike parking covered from the rain, but as close as the parking, good point. So um, keep the parking for bicycles and pedestrians or bicycle parking um, as close to the station as possible. Uh, any other thoughts? Um, uh, comment, oh, sorry, please use native plants. Great comment. Um, so Florida friendly landscaping, for example. Um, any other thoughts on maybe transit? Um, what are some of the feeder? We, we talked about how to get down to Doral, um, but are there other areas we need to think about in terms of uh, connecting to um, from the line or to the line from a certain other place? Um, are there other destinations that were that might be near the corridor that you know we didn't mention um, that we just kind of missed any thoughts okay protected bike lanes good within some reasonable radius of stations not shared with roads um, so that's a, a point for um, physically separated bicycle facilities whether those are at grade on the on the road or um, as side paths. And I, I think that may be a really strong key component, um, especially uh, thinking about, for example, at the 87th Avenue, that interchange was just um, reconstructed a few years ago. Um, and it's, it's quite wide um, on 87th Avenue. And so keeping that feeling comfortable and safe for pedestrians and cyclists um, will be a key point for us in this effort, as well as working with DTPW. Pedestrian friendly stations, covered shaded outdoor seating and cafes, et cetera. Good point. You can see we're getting a whole lot of ideas on the chart. Um, and what's great is we, we, like I said, we also had a meeting last evening and got some great ideas here. So all of this will help as we um, look to bring it all together in our document and then working collaboratively with our, our friends at DTBW as they advance um, the rapid transit corridor studies. So um, just a couple more minutes of, if you have some more thoughts before we run back out into our PowerPoint to close us down. Ooh, so design that is pandemic friendly. So, all right, that's a great comment, so, but it, it prompts me to ask a question. What does that mean? Um, does that mean that we have wide sidewalks so that people can walk, you know, away from other people? Um, does it mean that we have, oh, many of our stations are open air, but lots of separate seating? Um, does it mean that we have, I don't know, hand sanitized stations <laughs> along the route? Um, I don't know. Um, it's a, it's a great point. So if, if you have some thoughts about what would that mean, uh, please go ahead and put those in the chat. For stations that are elevated, consider waiting areas below to avoid traffic noise. Notification map showing arrival of buses. That's a, a great point. Um, especially, yeah, along 836, that might be, um, you know, keeping that quiet um, would be key. So whether that's, um, you know, waiting areas below is mentioned there, or maybe it, it means that we have some um, some sound buffering in the waiting areas. Uh, 
uh, okay, some some comments, I think, into the um, pandemic, but also to resiliency, air circulation, natural ventilation, cooling centers, um, ideas for stations to explore. Um, and then it noted that open air is a lot cheaper than AC, of course. So maybe just good natural circulation is the is the best answer. Okay, now here's some answers Pan on pandemic friendly design automatic doors. Good point. Spaced out benches and as we just talked about natural circulation. And I, I guess also, um, which is something um, that a lot of transit agencies will be going to the contactless efforts. Um, and I believe Miami's doing that as well. Um, we do have a question that came in. Will there be any more dedicated bus lanes along major arterials leading to the stations? Um, I will look to our friends at DTBW, Francisco or Tara. You have any thoughts on that? Uh, so this uh, this project does include uh, red bus lanes along Northwest Seventh uh, Street. Um, there are other uh, smart plan quarters that are are recently received an LP. I think the Flagler uh, is going to go. Uh, bus only lanes for a segment um, and uh, bus yeah yeah that is one of the uh, requests from the bus up the bus operators more more red paint so okay. we're trying to put it in as, as much as we can we currently have a, a project along uh, northwest 12th street in front of dolphin mall that will be installing red paint uh, as well there uh, so um, it, it's along along it, 12th it, you said Yes. Uh, yeah. Northwest 12th Street. Okay. From so the from Dolphin Station. Mall. Yeah. From Dolphin Station to, um, uh, you know, just east of Dolphin uh, Mall. Okay. Great. Uh, like uh, one, one tenth, one eleventh. Yeah, exactly. Okay. That, that's great. That's a good point. And, and, you know, that to the, the question, and we'll put that, of course, on the board. Um, but maybe there's a desire for, and maybe there's a way to do more of it um, along some of the north-south arterials. Um, obviously, it's always a challenge balancing. Um, you know, when you have a tight, uh, uh, tight right of way, uh, how do you accommodate the transit-only lanes without taking away, for example, vehicle lanes? Um, and that's a question. I know that was something that DTPW um, dealt with, especially on the Seventh Street corridor. Um, we also saw in the chat um, multilingual signage wayfinding. Um, equaling, of course, equitable access. Good point. Um, looking for keeping this diverse and inclusive for everyone. So maybe even audible signage um, in some cases for um, visually impaired folks. Okay, and then we say an east-west path, in, I can talk, an east-west path, there we go, is needed to complete the bike bed Miami Loop. Yes, um, I had have was uh, taking a look at the Miami Loop and some of the recommendations from that just the other day. Um, an extension, for example, of the Ludlam Trail going east-west, and if we can connect that into uh, the existing trail along 836, that would be a terrific uh, opportunity. And there are examples um, globally, worldwide, of BRT systems, for example, that have been able to incorporate uh, shared use paths uh, near or adjacent to them. Um, so that is something that could be looked at, um, in this case, probably not in the middle of 836, but maybe to the north of 836 where the current trail is and extending that and connecting with Ludlam. All right, let's give it another, say, two minutes of anybody else got last minute questions, thoughts. All right, so another thing, electronic tracking of buses on smartphones and display screens in or near stations and audio to arrive climb. Perfect, um, definitely need to have uh, those next bus connections at Google Transit and things like that. Um, Move it is a worldwide app that's used by a lot of uh, folks, um, but definitely arrival station. You know, you could see if you if you knew that the bus was coming, you could you know quickly run if you needed to, uh, to get there and not miss it. But at the same time, um, the plan that DTPW has has you know buses coming every you know 
10, 15 minutes or so. Um, so hopefully waiting time would not be too bad. Any other last thoughts? Okay, a dial on the bus telling them how fast to go to get to the next station in time. Well, that's a good point. Yeah, um, a way for the buses to make sure that they're able to stay on time. Okay. Um, Maria, do we think if we've got everything, um, we'll go ahead and stop sharing and then I'll bring the PowerPoint back up as soon as I find my ability to do that. There we go. All right. Well, thank you very much, everyone. Um, I want to just kind of um, give you just a quick things as we're going um, on our way this evening. There, if you were really interested in everything you heard this evening, if you want to dive deeper into some of these other stations, um, the DTPW is working on a study um, looking at the transit oriented development around four stations at 107th, 97th, the Wedge and Lejeune. We've been working collaboratively with them um, and they are here tonight as you heard um, and we've been participating in their efforts. You can see online here a public comment crowdsource map um, where you can go online and give them some thoughts about what is needed at these different stations. Um, but they're also going to have some public meetings coming up in the next few weeks. Um, with the hope that they will be finishing their study um, just in, in the next few months. Again, focusing, they're going to do a deep dive. So they're going to get into a lot of detail um, at these stations that we're not doing in our effort. Um, so please uh, be on the lookout for those meetings coming up. And I'm going to now turn this over back over to Mary Terry to close us out. Thank you, Wyatt. Thank you for everybody to join us this evening. Uh, if you have any further questions, please, our uh, contact information is on the screen right now. Feel free to send us a question. And I would like, again, to thank you, everybody. Uh, have a wonderful night and be safe. Thank and you. Mary, Mary Terry, what, real quick, um, Tara has put in the chat the link to the crowdsource map for everyone. So you can just cl click on that if you want. It'll take you to their map because I know writing down those uh, links was probably pretty difficult. So thank you. Perfect. Thank you, Tara. Oh, Thanks, and, and there is a question. The, um, the recording is up, will be up on the Miami Dade TPO uh, YouTube channel, correct? Yes, Eric. Yes. Um, um, the recording will be available on the YouTube TPO channel and via our TPO website. So the recording from today and from last night will be available. Any other questions? All right. Thank, Thank you very much. Thank you. Be safe. Good night.